Hi, I'm Alistair, and this is the second video in a series explaining how you can create animatronic models using Arduinos and a remote controller like this. Now, in the last video, I looked at setting up the controller unit itself and programming the Arduino to be able to interpret up to six channels of analog signals. In this video, what I want to do is actually look at a example mechanism that you can control using those signals. And to start with, I want to look at a, a simple tentacle arm like this one. So um, I'm actually only using two input channels to control this mechanism. I can go up and down using the uh, Y axis of the right stick there. And I can also go left and right like that as well. And by sort of uh, combining those two movements, you can create something uh, fairly organic and sort of tentacle looking. I grew up um, watching programs like Dark Crystal and Labyrinth with the Jim Henson puppets uh, that had these sort of fantastical uh, movements like this. And you can create quite a similar organic movement. Now, um, the actual mechanism, there's a couple of different designs for um, arms like this. If I show you one a bit more close up, so this is a, a basically an identical copy to the one I've got running here. So um, it's composed of a number of um, segments and each segment is connected via a joint. And the point is that the joints alternately allow movement either in uh, the Y axis like that or in the X axis, but not at the same time. So this particular joint between these two uh, positions here will only bend in that direction, but this one here will only bend in that direction. And then what you have is you have um, tension. In this one, I've got uh, springs holding them up. In this one over here, I've got rubber bands, but they provide the same effect. So that kind of holds the joints in a neutral position. And then I've got uh, two servo motors on the back, which are attached to a thin piece of uh, fishing line or stiff wire. And they will pull the joint in the opposing direction to the springs are holding it. So you have one controlling the uh, X and one controlling the Y. And by combining those uh, movements together uh, with a control like this, you can create a movement like this. And here's how I've got that wired together. So I've got my remote control receiver unit, which has got six individual channel signals. And those are mapped to six digital pins on the Arduino. Uh, so I'm using from pins two to pin seven on this side here. I've also got a ground and five volt supply just powering the receiver unit there. And then on this side, I've got my two servo motors, but I'm not actually uh, connecting them directly to an Arduino. I've got uh, this board here, I'm trying, this is a PCA9685, which is a uh, 16 channel PWM controller. So if you've got any devices like servo motors, the way that um, you send a command to a servo motor to set its position is via a, a pulse width modulation signal, a PWM signal. And uh, that tells the servo motor to move to a particular angle, normally between 0 and 180 degrees. And you can uh, send that signal directly via any of the PWM um, enabled output pins on the Arduino, so pins um, 3, 5 and 6 for example, uh, are all capable of sending those sorts of signals. But you run out of pins um, pretty quickly. So this is an alternative, this is a, a board which will actually handle sending up to 16 PWM signals. So you could have 16 different servo motors here. It also acts as a power distribution to those servo motors. So um, rather than trying to run 5 volt power directly to the servos from the 5 volt pin here. We've got an external 5 volt power source. Um, so if you supply a sort of a, a 3 amp power source for that, that's going to make sure you've got plenty of current, plenty of power available to, um, uh, to operate all these servo motors. And you can also send 16 PWM singles to them just using two wires from the Arduino for an I squared C interface. So uh, SDA goes to the analog 4 pin, SCL goes to the analog A5 pin, and then we just have 5 volt and ground going to the Arduino. But this 5 volt here is not actually powering the motors. The 5 volt is simply powering the chip here. The power supply to the motors comes in from this external power source here. And so if you make this a, a beefy 5 volt supply, you can be uh, guaranteed to have enough current to actually supply all these motors.
And here's the code I've got running on the Arduino. Now this is based on the example which I showed in my last video. So um, I won't go into too much detail and just cover the same ground. I'll just point out what I've changed about it. So I'm using uh, something called the Fast RC Reader Library. And that uses uh, interrupts on the Arduino pins. So rather than using um, you know, digital read, which is a relatively slow function to, to read the value on a GPIO input, uh, we're actually using pin change interrupts. And um, if you're not familiar with them, they're, they're a little bit more complicated to use, but they're more powerful and crucially, they're faster to react to um, a pulsating signal. And it's the pulse in the signal on those pins. That's how we're going to read what the input from the remote control was. So uh, that's why we're, we're making use of this slightly more uh, complex terminology. But the main thing is that the, the interrupt pin changes on Arduino are grouped into three sets. Um, like I say, I'm using the inputs from pin two to pin seven, and they're in the third set here. So I'll define the ports to use as set three. That's going to enable me to use the interrupts on those pins. Uh, we'll include the wire library because I'm using the I2C connection method to the uh, PCA9685 controller. Uh, this library itself is going to uh, enable us to interface with that controller. And this is the library for reading the input signals from the remote controller. Uh, we'll define six channels and these are the pins that the six channels are mapped to. And then here I've actually defined four output channels. Now, remember I said I was actually only using two uh, outputs for this particular example. I've got a single tentacle that has an X and a Y axis. So I'm actually only using two. But in my code, I'm defining four and I'll explain why, uh, because this is sort of generic code that I wanted to be able to reuse for a number of different mechanisms. Um, so I don't only have a simple tentacle, which is what I've got to find here. That's just one example of the different behaviors that can be controlled using this code. Um, I've also got one here that has a random sort of distortion added to it as well to make it look a bit more natural. I've got uh, this one here, which is where you have uh, two, so maybe a left and a right, which are controlled with the two side sticks of the controller. And I've also got some IMEX as well. So uh, the idea that this code can have a maximum of four channels with these here actually, um, but I'm only using two of them for this particular example. Uh, we declare some uh, global variables here. And uh, here we've got the number of input channels, the number of output channels. And because we're routing all of our logic via an Arduino, there's no reason why inputs have to match up to outputs. So um, the example up here, so the, the, um, when you're using the wiggly one, for example, uh, the movement of the tentacle is controlled based on the input position of the joysticks, but it also has some additional logic added to it. Um, so you doesn't have to have a one-to-one -one mapping between inputs and outputs there. Um, so what we do in the, if I just skip this out for a moment and we'll, we'll jump down to the bottom instead. So in setup, we begin a serial connection. We'll begin a connection to the remote control interface. And we'll also begin a connection to the uh, PWM control interface. Just reset all the devices there. So that kind of sets up all of the different components. And then in loop, what we do is we loop over all of the input channels that have been defined get the current frequency, so get the current input in each of those channels, and we'll just print it out of the screen. And then we call this apply logic. So apply logic is gonna be this mapping that goes from input to outputs. And finally, having set the outputs on that, we actually assign them to the control itself. So this, this reads the inputs, this calculates what the outputs are going to be based on those inputs and any other rules that need to be applied. And then this section here actually applies the outputs and sends a corresponding value to the controller to move the servo motors to the correct position. So uh, going back to this applied logic, because this is where sort of all the, the magic happens, and that's this big chunk of code in the middle here. So um, essentially, the idea of this is that you can add as many different use cases as you want for whatever type of mechanism it is you're trying to control. The, um, the cases which I've got listed here are sort of meant to be examples that you can build off more than anything else. Um, so we'll look at the, the, the simple example because this is the one which I actually um, showed in the, in the video at the beginning of this video. So uh, it's very straightforward really. We'll first of all calculate movement in the 
x-axis, so we'll declare a variable, we'll initialize it as zero. We um, first of all check that we had a valid x input. So um, channel input zero, that's always going to be our x-axis that we use in uh, to move the tentacle on the x-axis. And valid values um, from the PWM signal of a remote controller are between 1,000 and 2,000, essentially. So we'll check that the input lies in that range. If it's outside that range, what it might mean is something like the controller is turned off, for example. If we're not receiving a valid input, uh, then we don't want to just wildly um, you know, swing the arm around. We want to wait until we're actually getting a, an input signal that lies within the valid range of values before we attempt to move the servo meter. So that's the point of that test there. And if it does lie in that range, well, let's calculate how far through that range it is and we'll map that to the value from minus 90 to 90. So that's what we're doing there is we'll say, okay, we've got a valid value, but it's currently somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 because that's what the input signal range is. And this is the range of angles that we want the uh, x-axis to move in. If you wanted to have a more constrained uh, range of movement, for example, you could do that instead, and that would give you more uh, precise movement, but over a limited range of values, for example. Um, so you might not want to be able to turn all the way from 90 degrees left to 90 degrees right. Um, and then having so this is an uh now an angle x is between minus 45 and 45 what we need to do now is convert that um angular value into a pwm value that we can send to the controller that's actually going to power the motor uh, so that's what this function here does we've got uh, pwm for angle and we supply the angle we want and what it will give us back is a, a value that we can send to the PWM controller that's going to move the servo motor to that angle. And then we do exactly the same uh, but with the Y input. So the Y input comes in on channel 1. Again it's a value between uh, 1000 and 2000 and we'll map that to the range of angular degrees that we want it to be uh, corresponding to. And then we'll convert that degree into a PWM value and assign it to channel output 1. So we've now got uh, two values in our channel output array that were assigned in the apply logic function here and then they will actually get passed to the controller in this function here. Now I've got some other uh, examples here as well so um, if we just take this one for example again we've still only got two inputs we've got channel input 0 and channel input 1 but now what you'll notice is rather than taking the x angular value and passing it straight to PWM for angle we've got this extra step in the meantime. Uh, so what I've got here is I've got millis, which is the time in milliseconds that the sketch has been running for. We'll multiply that by an arbitrary factor, so a small value just to give it quite a slow um, periodic movement. Take the sign of that, so we're now getting a value between minus one and one, and then we'll just multiply it by something. So if you wanted to get a, a, a more subtle movement, you could take this number down. If you wanted to get a faster movement, you could increase this value, for example. So you just sort of change it around until you get the sort of the, the visual behavior that you're looking for, basically. And again, we do that in the Y. And I've set the Y to be a different value than the X so that they don't get um, in sync with each other. That, that looks a bit kind of artificial if you have them just moving the same. So by default, I want them to be slightly different values from each other. Um, and then I've got some other examples here. So uh, for this one here where we have the dual tentacles, you'll notice that I'm defining an extra variable x2 and y2 and um, we're assigning these to the channel outputs 2 and 3. Uh, and for IMEX, which I, I, which I haven't looked at in this video but might look at in the next one, um, we've got some extra logic here. So we've got the, the random chance of the eye deciding to blink um, based on the elapsed time since the last blink. So that sort of overrides the normal eyelid control because it's sort of a blink is an involuntary reaction basically that we're saying happens in the code irrespective of what the controller wrote. So, um, but you can add your own examples here however you want. You can, you know, there's no rules about, um, there's certainly no rules about the way that alien tentacles move. <laughs> but um, even if you're trying to model a naturalistic kind of um, object, uh, what you, you essentially do is just try different functions to get something that looks like 
uh, the behavior that you want to control. And that's it.